William Hopefully, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. My name is Sherry Smith. I'm a professor of history and I'm the co-director of the Clement Center for Southwest Studies at Southern Methodist University along with Andy Graybell. Are you here, Andy? I can't, I can't see, but my co-director. Oh, there he is over here. Thank you very much. Um, and also on behalf of the co-conveners of, of today's event, uh, Professor Andrew Torget from the University of North Texas who's over here, and Professor Gerardo Guza from the Instituto Mora in Mexico City. What we're going to do this afternoon is uh, have a public conversation, which is part of an international symposium called Violence in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. And I just wanted to say a few words about the genesis of the bigger project and then turn the podium over to Dr. Torget and Dr. Guza. This is part of an annual series that the Clement Center for Southwest Studies has. We bring together the best minds to consider important topics of our time. And we primarily emphasize the value of historical analysis to come to deeper understanding of these kinds of issues. Now this particular project had its genesis uh, several years ago when Drs. Torget and Dr. Gerza approached us and asked us if we would be interested in doing something on this very timely and important issue of violence in the U.S. borderlands. And of course, we quickly jumped at the chance to do so. That was maybe four years ago. Is it possible? Four years ago. So you can see this is a long time in the planning stage. Eventually, uh, we got around to the process of selecting the participants and ended up with a, spell a stellar group of scholars who come from Mexico United States and also from the United Kingdom. Then this past fall, we all met in Mexico City where the participants presented their papers on this issue of violence in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. They spent several days reading one another's work, critiquing one another, and then going home and revising them for the second go-around, which we've just been doing this weekend here in Dallas. But of course, it's one thing to talk to other scholars, but it's more important actually that these ideas get disseminated beyond our seminar rooms. And that's where uh, two things are going to happen. First of all, ultimately these papers, these essays will be published in a book that we hope will be read around the world. But also in today's afternoon conversation with you, our audience. I also uh, want to thank, before I relinquish the microphone, a number of people. First of all, Ruth Ann Elmore, the Assistant Director of the Clemens Center, who has seen to all of the details for the past several days events. Also, I want to thank Benjamin Espino of the Latino Cultural Center and the City of Dallas for allowing us to meet with you in this beautiful room. Jennifer Ochoa, the attache of the Mexican Consulate, who is supporting this project. Uh, the SMU Embry Human Rights Program, all of the panelists and scholars who will be introduced to you in a few moments, and then finally all of you who have come this afternoon. Thank you for coming. Hello. <laughs> uh, I want to say um, welcome to the symposium. My name is uh, Andrew Torget. I'm one of the co-conveners, as Sherry was just describing. And I just wanted to say two things. One, thank you to the Clement Center and the Institute of Mora for making all of this possible, gathering everybody together. And secondary, I just wanted to reiterate what Sherry talked about, that the idea behind this project and what we're doing is trying to put some historical context around the problem of violence along the U.S.-Mexico border. because. I, in popular culture and in movies and in TV and in all kinds of ways, it seems like there's this timelessness about violence at the border. The way it's portrayed in popular media is it's always there, it's always inherent, that it's just natural to the border. And it's not. The current conflicts along the border, the drug wars that get the most of the headlines that we read about every day in the Dallas Morning News or the New York Times or the Houston Chronicle or wherever, it doesn't have to be that way all the time. And so the idea with the project was to bring together scholars for a truly international conversation. Half the scholars were to be from uh, Mexico, half were going to be from the United States. That's pretty much how it worked out with uh, an addition of a few people from the UK. Um, but the idea was to bring us together for an international conversation because we're putting together a book 
that tries to look at the evolution of violence over time as a way of understanding how it changes. And it's a part of historical circumstances that violence in the 1820s is not the same thing as what happened in the 19 teens or in the present day. And so the idea of the whole project is built around that. And the idea of these, these conversations are to have some informed discussions amongst the scholars and current journalists about the state of violence, its historical roots, and how it comes up to the present day. So the three panels that we have today are dealing with borderlines and the power of the state. That's the first panel we're about to hear. And then we have one on smuggling and drugs along the border is our second panel. And the third one is on refugees, migrants, and mobs. So the way we're going to do this is sort of an open panel kind of conversation. Uh, here Ricardo and I are going to moderate these discussions and try to get the conversation going. And we want to invite you into that conversation. And so we'll be able to throw it open to the floor for questions. And we hope you guys have questions of both our scholars and the, the three journalists who we'll be introducing who've been kind enough to, to join us to give a contemporary advantage to this entire endeavor. So I want to say thank you for coming. And I'm going to turn it over to the first panel so that we can get started to my, my good friend, Dr. Gurza, who's going to introduce the first panel and the panelists. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, good afternoon to you all and thank you for coming. Um, well, first of all, I, I'd like to uh, seize the opportunity to, uh, to thank on behalf of the Instituto Mora of Mexico City, to thank the Clement Center for the wonderful opportunity to be a, a partner in this, in this project. Uh, the Instituto Mora has had uh, traditionally a, a lot of interest in the relationships between Mexico and the United States and also in the history of the United States. So this, is, this was really an ideal project for, for us to, to participate and, uh, and, and we're, well, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, and I, I thank, uh, of course, uh, Andrew Grabiel, Sherry Smith, Ruth Ann Elmore, and of course my dear friend and colleague Andrew Target for the, for the invitation. And thanks. Well, uh, this first panel is um, about uh, the state. It's called Drawing Border Lines and the Role of the State. Uh, it is a really big subject, and uh, let's see how we can tackle it. And, uh, well, uh, I'm going to introduce real, really quick uh, the, the scholars in this, in this panel. We have uh, with us uh, Timothy Bowman of uh, West Texas A&M University. Uh, we have uh, also Gabriel Martinez Serna del Centro de Investigaciones y Estudios Superiores en Antropología Social, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Brandon Morgan from Central New Mexico Community College. Uh, Joaquin Rivaya Martinez from Texas State University San Marcos. Marcela Terraza Silasante, del Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas de la UNAM. Uh, of course, Alan Knight from Oxford University. And uh, we're also very pleased to have uh, with us uh, this afternoon Alfredo Corchado from the Dallas Morning News uh, and uh, author of, uh, of Midnight in, in Mexico, which was uh, published a couple of years ago. Okay, so um, let's start with... Uh, with the, the role of the state in, uh, in preventing or uh, creating the, the conditions for violence to arise in the, in the borderlands of uh, Mexico and the United States. Uh, the first thing that we have to take into consideration perhaps is the, well, the governments uh, not always have a real presence in, the, in what we know today as the border between the United States and, and Mexico. So uh, the first uh, question, I, I guess it would be, when do the, government, the governments, uh, either of the US or Mexico, really start having a presence in the border? Uh, and of course, uh, any of our panelists can uh, jump in and, and, and try to, to answer. Anyone? <laughs> um, well, I would say the obvious response would be that this begins in 1848, for the modern period at least, when the borderline is drawn between the two nations. But of course, it's going to take some time for both, the federal, for both federal governments to really be able to catch up with being able to enforce 
a line on the ground. So one of the things that we've been discussing this weekend is that there was seemingly an uptick in violence in the 1860s and 1870s, or at least it became more visible to a lot of people because lawbreakers could cross the border to commit acts of crime or violence for their own purposes. And then I, I think that this, the answer to when state control really begins to arrive on the region really depends on which nation you're discussing and whom you ask. Um, it seems to me that um, uh, Gabriel Martinez Serna's paper would indicate that there were certain mechanisms of state control that were stronger in Mexico before they really were in the United States north of the border. So, and in my own view, this is something that you don't really see um, state power really, or the muscles of state power really flex concurrently in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands until much later in the, the 20th century when the Mexican Revolution is over and there are increased efforts um, among Americans to try to control the border, which is, of course, controlling the border is something that we would certainly need to discuss from the perspective of the state. So the, the idea of state power for modern nation states for me really begins to kick in in 1848, but it's a very, very long and complicated process, naturally. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then something else that just came to mind as Tim was talking um, in terms of, of state power is that drawing the, the border itself was um, something that required a uh, boundary commission to come together. And this isn't actually something we talked about much um, in our discussions of our papers and so forth. Um, but each nation sent boundary commissioners to El Paso in order to delineate and kind of draw the border on the ground. Um, and so just from the get-go, there was this, uh, there had to be kind of this initial step for the state to actually go and, and say this is where the line is. Um, and something I also think is interesting is that the, the Rio Grande, um, or Rio Bravo, uh, it changed course in 1849. So it even seemed like a, a fixed section of the border that might not have to be de delineated. Um, but that was, again, something that, that state officials had to contend with and uh, think about, especially when the river moved and the towns of San Elisario, Socorro, and Isleta um, were all of a sudden on the U.S. side of the river when they had been on the Mexican side. Um, and so, so just kind of setting the stage maybe for thinking about all of the different things that the two state governments had to contend with um, as they were trying to establish and assert uh, a border between the two nations in the mid-19th century. Okay. Can I just add a quick word? I'm a historian of Mexico, so I see it much more from the Mexican side, but, and I take the point that Tim made, but I think there is a very rough congruence going on at the end, towards the end of the 19th century. It's a moment in which both states, the US following the Civil War and Reconstruction, and even more Mexico after the upheavals of the French invasion, the, a degree of political stability is achieved under Porfirio Diaz in, in Mexico. The, the state is solvent, it has resources, it can build border posts and customs, and the fiscal, getting taxes is very important. And lastly, they have infrastructure. The railway systems meet up in the 1880s, uh, telegraphs are, are brought in, so states can now control and have more information about what's going on. The border, of course, remains very porous. It's a huge border, so people can come and go and cross, and they're smuggling and contraband and so on. But nevertheless, I would say the last, the end of the 19th century is a moment in which what had hitherto been a kind of line on the ground, a border, becomes a genuine border which is partially policed by two states that recognize each other's sovereignty. And it's evident when Porfirio Diaz, the president, met President Taft uh, on the border in, in 1910. That was a, a good symbolic example of that. Okay. Uh, May I add something? Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, maybe I'm, I'm going to speak half in English and half in Spanish, so I will feel more comfortable. Well, uh, what I would like to add is that uh, between 1848 and maybe 1870s or 1880s, the, the governors, the caciques or the caudillos, were the ones that had the control of the, or the, of the border region. Uh, better than the, the federal state in Mexico, at least. Okay, can I add some? Uh, sure. No, I, ju I just would like to add that uh, in my own research, I, I study uh, American Indians from the southwest, uh, the Rio Grande borderlands, as we refer to sometimes. And uh, I want to emphasize the fact that, uh, in spite of the fact that there is a, a boundary line uh, 
recognized by both countries in 1848 to many of the people and many, many of the communities living on either side of that border, uh, that didn't mean anything really. Um, in, the, in the years and even in the decades after the Mexican-American War, there was no significant control by either state in the region, right? And you can actually argue that the, uh, even, even at, at considerable distances from that boundary line, neither the United States nor the, nor the Mexican state uh, controlled their territory. And in the specific case that I studied, which is the incursions of the Comanche Indians uh, south of the border, it wasn't until the 1870s when they were militarily defeated on the southern plains that the, the raids into Mexico actually came to, a, to an end. So, okay. Yeah, so, uh, and, and I think it's, uh, that raises the question uh, if uh, we take into consideration that usually uh, in Mexican historiography, and I, I would say that also in, in, in American history too, 1848 and the, and the war uh, between the U.S. and, and Mexico is, taking, is taken as a, such an important milestone. So uh, the drawing of the line didn't mean anything. Didn't uh, didn't it change anything in the in the border region? Uh, okay. yeah, sure. Well, in English and in Spanish. <laughs> well, yes, I think that uh, the new line, the new border. Uh, really uh, had consequences for violence. Not because the line itself, but the changes of demography and the movement of people toward California or New Mexico, especially toward California. And those people needed mules, needed cattle, needed horses. And so uh, cattle theft became a more uh, profitable uh, business and in that business uh, Indians, Mexicans and Americans participated and when cattle business uh, had a boom it was in the 50s, 60s and so on uh, it, uh, it became the, the, the source of a very violent uh, situation. If I sure. may, I, well, one of the things that we haven't discussed this weekend is, of course, 1848 brought about um, a very fateful decision for the Mexican citizens who lived in those areas that mm -hmm. became a part of the American Southwest, mm -hmm. that you either stay and are given a year, I believe it is, by virtue of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo to become a citizen of the United States, or you leave and um, go to, to within the confines or the newly defined confines of Mexico. And I think that's something that is also going to lead to um, a lot of negative encounters between peoples after 1848, even if they aren't crossing the border. Um, you know, there will be issues related to um, Anglos coming in and um, intimidating people, pushing them off of land, um, misappropriating land. Uh, issues with um, properties that had not had um, property taxes paid on them, for example, which is something that a number of scholars have written about. Benjamin Johnson, I think, from SMU, or excuse me, from Loyola, um, most notably, that when someone, of course, doesn't pay taxes on land because they don't speak the language of the new um, nation that's come in and colonized their homeland space, and then they wind up losing that land, that creates a, a, a um, a, a tense atmosphere in southwestern communities across the borderline. So, of course, in that way, 1848 is an incredibly important year, even if the borderline itself between the two nations is, nations is incredibly difficult to police or define even. Okay. Very well. So, uh, uh, if we all, all agree that uh, it, it is in the latter part of the 19th century that this, the governments and the states uh, start having the, the power and the resources to make their uh, presence felt uh, in, the, in the border areas. Uh, that's certainly the case of the Porfiriato in, in Mexico, but uh, at the same time we have the Gilded Age in the United States. Is there some kind of parallel we could draw between what is going on in Mexico and at the same time on the other side of the Texas border? Or? Sure, I think it's a parallel process. Um, I mean, and there's a lot of similarities or, or, or parallels, if you want to call it. Um, just uh, for different reasons and for common reasons, um, both both states um, federalize uh, the in the border. Um, 
in the case of the Porfiriato, you know, it's uh, mounted police, uh, the equivalent of the Texas Rangers, but also a new uh, and, and federally controlled customs, uh, customs house, which is uh, terribly important, not just for patrolling the border, but also for uh, taxes. taxes. Uh, in the American side, um, after reconstruction, you know, the, uh, the army takes a bigger role, but even after um, you get into the Gilded Age, uh, you certainly surges of investments in, in uh, railroads and mining um, bring b both countries uh, together. And I think by both economies coming together, it just reinforces the presence of the states on both sides of the border. So. I just wanted to add, um, maybe it works without me moving it. Um, just wanted to add also, um, I've, I've looked at the area around El Paso and going a little bit west uh, into the New Mexico Chihuahua border and some of the decisions made by the government of Porfirio Diaz in terms of providing concessions for the modernization of uh, and development of the border region. Um, turned resources over to uh, private companies, whether they were for colonization, for town site building, for ranching, for railroads, uh, trade, whatever it might be. And it was actually those, um, those concessions that drew um, investors not only from Mexico, but from uh, the United States to the border area. And uh, going from El Paso West, you know, it was a place that uh, was sort of in need of, of construction. It had been seen as as the um, home grounds, the stomping grounds of Apaches and Comanches until uh, the late 1870s, 1880s, and so it was seen as a new opportunity. Um, and so, what I wanted to emphasize is that by kind of turning over to private development, um, the the border region, the state um, in Mexico, especially. Um, through those kinds of policies that allowed this kind of development, um, built on the, the violence that had been enacted to dispossess and kind of remove Apaches and Comanches from their lands in order to create towns um, that sprung up along the border. Yeah, well, uh, and uh, that, that's uh, almost, uh, well, it's uh, the, the very late uh, stage of the 19th century. And then we have another, uh, probably what it, what it means or what it amounts to another big milestone in the, in the history of violence in the border, which would be the Mexican Revolution. What, what does the Mexican Revolution change uh, in terms of uh, the occurrence of violence? Uh, well, how, how long have you got? <laughs> But, um, well, I was going to say, following up the last point, obviously, although there were states building on both sides of the frontier and there was some degree of shared infrastructure, a flow, big flow of trade and investment, mostly investment from the U.S. to Mexico, they were still very different societies. I mean, the U.S. was much more developed, more industrial, more urban, a country of immigrants, uh, very productive with relatively higher incomes. Mexico was poorer, less industrial, more rural, less literate, and it had a very large, dense peasantry, often an Indian peasantry, and they were subjected to increased pressures by that new state and by certain private interests through the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and the last factor that's also different, although US democracy was very far from perfect in the beginning of the 20th century, there were at least parties in elections on a regular basis. Uh, Mexico was still largely a personal dictatorship under Porfirio Diaz, who was a very skilled statesman, but an autocrat. And in 1910, as many of you know, a major revolution broke out in, in Mexico, which led to 10 years of major civil war, which was the Mexican Revolution, which changed Mexico substantially, I would argue. There are some revisionists who play down the changes, didn't turn Mexico into a socialist state, but it did change the nature of the government, introduced social reform. In some ways it strengthened the state and had implications for the border, first by posing challenges to the border. There were battles along the borderline. The north, the borderlands were in many ways one of the real centers of revolutionary mobilization. Pancho Villa from Chihuahua, the División del Norte, the biggest revolution, a successful revolutionary army from Chihuahua, which advanced down and broke the power of the old regime. So the North played a vital role, and the last point simply to make is that because of that, uh, 
the new regime which emerged in Mexico City in the 1920s was in many ways a northern regime, a regime of fronterizos or norteños uh, who carried with them some of the almost the sort of genetic makeup in metaphorical terms of the north and tried in a way to impose their model on the rest of Mexico, which I think they did for better or worse with some success. And, and would you say that after the, that violent period of the Mexican Revolution, then the Mexican state was uh, far more able to control the border area and to have a presence and to suppress violence? Or uh... Uh, I would say probably yes. I think it wouldn't figure among the most important consequences of the Mexican Revolution. There were others, such as land reform in central Mexico, which was more important. But the revolution, I think, did over a bit of time create a stronger state, a more centralized and capable state. Uh, and it's interesting that after this huge outbreak of violence, through the 1920s and 30s, even beyond, the border region is fairly quiet. I mean, we've discussed violence in the 19th century, in the revolution, we discussed violence at the end of the 20th century. There's a period from the 20s through till perhaps the 1980s in which the border is, by comparative terms, relatively tranquil, peaceful, and commercially successful. So I think the revolution doesn't explain all of that, but it contributes to it. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and that brings us to the to the 20th century and to, to more uh, to the more uh, contemporary era, and uh, and if if that happened after the Mexican Revolution and uh, it, if it was uh, a process of uh, more consolidation in the 20th century, well, we we might ask what happened. Uh, in the late 20th century and in the beginning of the 21st century, and why did it all turn uh, more violent? And uh, I, I, I guess uh, Alfredo would have uh, an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the drug war. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I've, I'm sitting here very fascinated, uh, and I keep telling myself I'm, I'm a reporter, so I'm, I'm taking all this stuff down. Um, I mean, I. It's it's apparent that um, if you look at the at the late 1930s, 1940s, and you see what what happens in Badiraguato, Sinaloa, and and the rise of the, uh, of the of the first cartel, I mean it's essentially a one alliance, um, and and it's very heavily government control at the time very much the, the PRI controlling, the, I mean, to, to the point where it's, it's difficult to understand who's, who the government is, who the criminals are, because it's basically the co-option is there, it's one and one. And I think for many, many years, uh, it, it continued that way. And I think the, the violence was limited to in-house, um, people not agreeing with one another, but it wasn't an all-out war, as, as we saw, uh, I think, in beginning in the 1980s with the uh, Amado Carrillo Fuentes and Ciudad Juarez, et cetera. But I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I mean, I think that was the key uh, moment where you had these, it's a very one alliance, um, el, el Padrino, uh, este, eh, Fonseca, and, and, and the others who, who become uh, a, a one group, and it's, it's ironically, it's not until they realize uh, after Kiki Camarena is, is uh, kidnapped and killed, when the, when the U.S. government begins to pressure, that they begin to break off. This whole alliance begins to break off, and and the same people from this one community, Badiraguato, and, and the surrounding area, uh, El Padrino begins to say, okay, you're in charge of this plaza, you're in charge of that plaza. Uh, Carrillo Fuentes in the north, uh, you had uh, Chapo Guzman at the uh, El Pacifico, um, the um, interesting, uh, the Gulf Cartel in the south was not really part of the alliance, and they were really not into, into illicit drugs, they were much more into into trading, into illicit trade in the South, but eventually they, they ended up becoming the, the, the cocaine smugglers. Um, but it was very much one, one family, one, if you will, one, one extended uh, group of people who, who control that area for the longest time. Well, there's a, a famous anthropologist who, who says that uh, the state has been uh, both the source of our freedoms and the source of our miseries. And, uh, and I guess uh, 
there's something related to that in what we're uh, seeing here. So uh, just as a general question to, to whoever wants to, to, to say something about it. Uh, what has been the role of the state in suppressing violence? Has it been uh, effective in that? Has it been, uh, I mean, its intervention has only worsened things? What has been the, the role of the state in, in, in general? Uh, I know it's, uh, I mean, to answer is to simplify things a, 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 <laughs> only a little bit, but uh, it's a provocative question, so. You want to go? Well, there was a sociologist as well, Weber, who said that, that, that the state essentially has a monopoly or should have a monopoly of legitimate violence, but in reality it's not always like that. Mm -hmm. And I would say that in the case of the state controlled by the pre or the kind of, the, the, the mix, the very complex mix between the state and the party that dominated Mexico in a particular period we just heard about, um, that uh, the state was prepared to use violence in a somewhat camouflaged way. There were not overt guerra sucias as there were in Argentina and Brazil with outright repression, but there was certainly violence against dissidents, against journalists, and the plaza system, which has just been well described, was another way in which the pre controlled illicit activities and crime and maintained the whip hand over these activities for many decades. Since the 1980s, and I agree, that's the watershed for a variety of reasons. One, I think the sheer demand for drugs in the United States, which is crucial to the whole operation, and secondly, the delegitimization of the PRI, the PRI's loss of power and popularity, and finally loss of the presidency in 2000, I think that removed the kind of central political control. Now, not ideal to have a political party that's dominant and that controls drug interests and uses selective violence, uh, but the result of that, in the ending of that corrupt system, was a war between different cartels, a war in which the state in 2006 attempted to crush the cartels and largely, I think, failed, and the level, levels of violence uh, uh, increased. So, uh, looking back on it, although the old pre-state was highly corrupt, it did at least perform a few functions, and at the moment, I think we're left with many unanswered questions as to what sort of state could emerge in Mexico and whether it could deal with these very intractable problems. I mean, I, I would describe the PRI, and I think many people have, I know many historians have in, in the past, the PRI was really the strong father figure. And the weaker the, the PRI became, the wilder the boys, I mean, got out of hand. Uh, and that's essentially what happened in, in Mexico. I mean, as, as we look back, um, as a reporter covering uh, Ciudad Juarez back in the early 1980s, it was, it was, it was pretty evident that something that someone had lost control. Something was happening uh, th throughout uh, throughout the country, but especially in the Ciudad Juarez, uh, El Paso area, and that something was really uh, the pre after 1982, when the uh, the, the big peso devaluation becomes weaker and weaker. Uh, you start having uh, the opposition party, the PAN, uh, becoming stronger, especially in that region. And you had a lot more pressure from, uh, pressure from the U.S. government. The more pressure you had, I think the, the things just became sort of to uh, uh, dis, dis, disentangle, if you will. Um, I was just going to add, I don't know that the American state ever gets rid of violence in so much as it uses it to its own end. And my mind goes to American immigration law, beginning with the Immigration Act of 1917, in which we see the American state committing acts of what I would consider violence on the bodies of Mexican immigrants. You know, it's well documented in places like El Paso that immigrants were forced to undergo um, uh, gasoline baths and have had DDT, which is a horrible pesticide sprayed in their faces. And then, of course, a number of immigration historians have also looked at various immigration laws from 1917 to 21 to 24, and then again to another law in 1965 to show that it's through American immigration law that Mexicans were turned into sort of the, the iconic illegal immigrant in the public discourse of the United States. And that, of course, it in turn causes the American public to, to turn against uh, Mexican immigrants and have certain ideas about them being lawbreakers and not belonging in the United States, and then, of course, committing their own acts of violence against them. So I guess that's a bit of a long-winded way of saying that um, 
violence. Uh, to to echo um, Andrew's point when he uh, began when he opened this panel, violence doesn't really ever go away in the borderlands. It just shifts and changes over time, but it's still very much present throughout the 20th century and today. I'll add something. Sure. Well, um, just uh, uh, as a precursor to what would become the PRI, I think um, going back to the Porfiriato, which is what I'm, I'm talking about in, in, in this contribution, um, I think uh, the repressive apparatus that the Porfiriato starts building is one that, even though it is obviously transformed by the revolution and in many ways strengthened, uh, it is really the basis for the, uh, the repressive apparatus that you have today. It really, it is, that is perhaps the watershed you have in which before, as, as our colleague was saying, uh, the state violence was mostly in the hands of regional caudillos or governors, and it is really in that last two dec decades of the 20th century when the federal state comes in and starts taking, you know, starts building this repressive apparatus, and that will be the seeds of the um, repressive apparatus of the, of the PRI that then kind of starts falling apart in the 80s, so about a century later. Well, uh, anyone else or? Well, maybe we, we have a few minutes to, uh, well, to, to receive questions from, from the audience. Uh, so uh, if anyone would like to ask a question or if anyone has a comment, we would be delighted to hear it. The gentleman over there. Hello. We have a microphone. Here we go. Yes, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to ask if the the sale of the positions of police chief, for example, in the mid '80s in Chihuahua, the the the, the, the position of uh, the head of the of police in Chihuahua. Could, could you? Sorry. Could you speak closer to the microphone? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, I understand that the, during the 80s, to be police chief in, the, in Chihuahua costs about a million dollars. The drug lords would then funnel, pay approximately $100,000 a month to the police chief. A lot of that money would then go to Mexico City. So there would be no, no, no incentive to break the drug movement. And any kind of viol anybody who got out of line, of course, would have to be dealt with violently. But that would contribute to the violence. Does anyone have a comment on that? I mean, I, I think the corruption was has has been pretty endemic for many years. Uh, Chihuahua, Coahuila. I mean, a, a lot of the border states are, are very key, uh, and and corruption. It's, it's, I mean, it's uh, it. Any time you have an election, maybe three years, maybe six years, you know. It's it's not really about appointing the best person, but about uh, who whose price can you can you meet, et cetera. Uh, but I think one of the things that uh, we also have to look at closely is is the role of the U.S. government and the unintended consequences of, of U.S. policy. I spent the last six months uh, for the Morning News working on a on a big story. Uh, three years ago, there was an attorney, a Mexican attorney, killed in South Lake, Texas. And it, it, you know, killing an attorney in South Lake gangland style does not happen in Texas that much. So we, we spent a lot of time looking into it, um, and and found the how a plea deal between the U.S. government and at the time one of the biggest drug lords in Mexico, Osiel Cárdenas, uh, he, he was facing uh, maximum lifetime in prison. He ended up getting 25 years. The investigation shows how this plea deal uh, led to a, a, the, this lawyer at the time, the uh, Cardenas personal lawyer, bringing in money from Mexico from these underground bunkers throughout Tamaulipas, throughout Nuevo León. Uh, they bring in 50 billion, I mean million, in, in cash and assets. Ociel gets a, a light sentence. But the, the, the key was that the U.S. government wanted to splinter the cartels splinter the Gulf cartel and the Gulf cartel and, and the Setas, and that led to this horrific bloodshed along the Tamaulipas, the Coahuila border, uh, 
where thousands of people were, were killed. Um, massacres, uh, you know, we're talking about the uh, uh, migrants uh, from Central America, from th throughout Latin America. And I think, you know, as you, as you look back at, at the U.S. role, uh, there are many unintended consequences that I think, uh, uh, it, at least in this case, I mean, a, an attorney was caught right in the middle of that. And as you look forward, uh, I think people in Mexico, as they debate, you know, what is the future U.S. role in, in Mexico, uh, I think there are many lessons to be drawn from this. Okay. Uh, I wonder if any of the panelists would like to comment that sometimes or all the time the reaction of the Mexican government is to American policy such as that at the uh, turn of the century 1913 income tax before uh, you know, tariffs and smuggling. And also the, the fact that the United States got involved in the First World War. And, and I'm, I know I'm taking big leaps here, but World War II coming up to even the present, uh, that when the United States values security, then there's a big focus on uh, you know, the illegal immigration, and when the United States has uh, something like the war on drugs, uh, this also fuels the, uh, the violence. In other words, Mexico is reacting to what the United States is doing. Well, I think um, the Mexicans are quite capable of violence themselves. I mean, Don Porfirio really was more reacting to his own, you know, consolidating his own power. Uh, and at least that violence is only marginally uh, related to the U.S. So there's, there's a bit of both, I would say. It's certainly some native Mexican violence of its own. I would say that uh, clearly Mexico reacts to the U.S. and what's happening here, though there is obviously some U.S. reaction to what happens in Mexico. It's not just one-sided. Economically, clearly it's very important what's happening in the U.S. economy because of the growing integration right through the 20th century, long before NAFTA. And if you look at flows of uh, Mexican migration to the U.S., uh, partly because of the revolution, it goes up, demand in the U.S. during the First World War, continues in the 20s, collapses with the depression, Mexicans, 300,000 are sent back to Mexico, picks up again in the Second World War with the Bracero program. So there are big cycles which respond very much to the US economy. But there's another story, very briefly, which is about security. And again, the two world wars are really interesting. In the First World War, because the US government feared German involvement in Mexico in the famous Zimmerman telegram, Mexico could play the United States quite successfully to get recognition for the revolutionary government. The US government didn't like the revolutionary government for all sorts of reasons, didn't like the new constitution, but because of the war and the security issue, they were kind of obliged to do a deal and, and, and recognize the government. In the Second World War again, Mexico in 38 nationalized the Anglo-American oil companies, not a very popular move in the US, but again, because of the fear of the Axis powers, Japan, Germany, and the onset of war, again, the United States had to some extent to recognize Mexican sovereignty. And I think Mexico has been quite skillful at playing on those opportunities, particularly at the time of the two world wars. I think in many respects, because of the nature of um, international politics between the United States and Mexico and Canada, and perhaps the fact that the United States can be described as hegemonic in certain respects, that it's easy to overlook Mexican agency in terms of the crafting of federal policy, right? And so one of the one of the programs that my mind goes to, Alan just mentioned, the Bracero program of World War II, which certainly there was a farm labor, so this was a, a guest worker agreement between the United States and Mexico to fulfill a farm labor shortage in the United States, which certainly there was such a thing during the war, but from the point of view of the Mexican state, engaging in such an agreement was a good thing because it allowed for the potential to protect Mexican workers from abuses that were rampant in places like Texas and Arizona and across the Southwest. Now, of course, to what degree that actually worked is quite debatable, and I think a number of historians of the Bracero program would argue that it did not. Never, nonetheless, I think the Mexican state certainly did assert itself 
in protecting um, a perceived need among people who were coming to the United States in the 20th century. And this was hundreds of thousands of people, of course. <laughs> I think this guy wants the microphone. The question is probably more uh, directed to Mr. Corchava, but anyone can jump in. Beth Juarez was known as the murder capital of women. Where did these murderers go? Then it became just the murder capital of the world. No one ever answered, where did the murderers of the women go? If I knew, I would, uh, I would write a story. <laughs> uh, I mean, the... Um Yes, it was known as the murder capital of women and murder capital of the world. Uh, I think it was kind of a stretch. I, I, I think it's safe to say it was murder capital of Mexico, maybe the Americas. I'm not sure about the world. Um, but it, again, I mean, it points to a very weak rule of law. It's ironically, on the, on the U.S. side of the border, you have some of the safest communities anywhere. Um, and I think for someone who lives in El Paso, Juarez, that's always been one of the the thing that you have to kind of, kind of uh, deal with on a very personal level, that you have family on, on the Mexican side, you have family on the U.S. side. Uh, I have family that uh, people who, who don't go back and forth like we used to, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I mean, we were, we were really one community. You would just go across the border. And it's, it seems kind of uh, interesting that in, in the last few years, you know, as Mexico becomes much more of a sort of an open society, I mean, you know, given all the problems Mexico has, uh, the challenges, but it's becoming much more of an open society at a time when, when the United States has become much, much more of a closed society, a uh, fearful society. And, I mean, we used to go across the border and just say American or U.S., but that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, but I think that as reporters, I mean, one, one of the stories that we, we, uh, we miss and that we, I think a lot of us continue to try to investigate is, uh, is the question of justice. In, in Mexico, the impunity rate remains at 95%. If, if you kill someone, there's a 95% chance you're going to get away with it. So your question of, you know, what happened to the murderers, we, we don't know at this point. There's a lot of, a lot of theories. Uh, every other year, there's, there will be a book come out, and I think someone will claim that they have the answer, but I don't, I don't know that anyone has the answer yet. Uh, yeah, so uh, my question kind of turns back to the, uh, the issue that we started the panel discussion with, which uh, when does the state sort of begin to become an actor in the borderlands? Um, and so I'm wondering, especially in the mid-19th century and earlier, to what extent is the state uh, an independent actor, an outside actor, a thing in itself? And uh, to what extent do local people uh, create and define its meanings in the borderland and, and construct state power through the ways that they turn to the state, uh, marshal the state, or attempt to resist the state? I think there are calls for state power um, pretty soon after 1848 when it's clear that people are crossing the border to commit crimes. In particular, you know, a big problem um, during the 1860s and 70s was cattle theft. And of course, when people were losing property left and right, well, you know, an, an answer to try to, to, uh, to to stop that that property loss is for the state to come in and sort of flex its muscle. But of course, this is something that takes some time to happen because it's a very complicated process. So there's certainly a consciousness of it by the 1870s, if not earlier. But um, I don't know uh, if my what my co-panelists would have to say. I think that th there is a, a feature of, of the history of the border in the earlier part of the 19th century that is missing uh, in later times, which is that apart from the two states, uh, the United States and Mexico, you have a whole series of independent communities of Native Americans that uh, are purportedly under the jurisdiction of the two nations, but de facto behave independently. And um, I think that's, a, that's an important uh, consideration to think of not just uh, these uh, different indigenous groups as agents in border violence, but also um, to uh, try to understand how um, the, let's say, the inefficiency of the state to protect uh, its citizens uh, in, on both sides of the border compel them to find 
um, you know, solutions of their own and, and in some cases to, to seek the opportunity. And you have, for instance, in the, in the central decades of the 19th century, a series of communities in northern Mexico who, uh, whose um, inhabitants uh, trade with uh, returning raiders from uh, interior Mexico uh, to whom they buy the, the, pretty much the horses and mules and even the captives that they have been um, taking in places such as uh, Durango. The state of Durango, for instance, was one of the ones uh, which suffered the most. So I think that's an important um, feature of border violence that as time goes by will disappear. Uh, I guess we have time for just one more question. So. I want to believe that in spite of the corruption, that some progress is being made in Mexico. I cannot believe that the time of Durazo and Lopez Portillo is still alive today. So could you address that issue? Can it get any worse than Durazo and Lopez Portillo? A era when the chief of police lived like Nero, and he was endorsed by the president of Mexico. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of progress uh, that has been made in Mexico. I, I, um, I mean, I think sometimes when I'm in Mexico City, I wake up in the morning, I think, wow, you know, we're two steps, two steps back. Sometimes you take a step forward. But I think, uh, just to give an example, I think uh, people always ask, you know, is Mexico going to change in the next five years, ten years? I mean, er eradicating corruption is going to take a long, long time. It's, it might not happen in our, our lifetime. But you see things, for example, like uh, social media, the ability for people around the world now to try to shame Mexico and to try to... Um, I, I always go back to a cab driver I saw in Mexico City. And if, you, if you're in Mexico City, you want to know what's going on in the country, you talk to a cab driver. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, um, Como el futuro? I mean, how do you see the future in Mexico? And he looks at his uh, glove compartment, and I'm thinking, oh my God, he's going to reach for a gun or something, you know? <laughs> and he pulls out the cell phone, the smartphone, and he says, este es el futuro. <laughs> and I said, how so? He says, we can't just blame people. You have to shame them. And I, I'm, I'm really convinced, as a journalist, that people in Los Pinos will listen more to what happens or the reaction outside Mexico City than what happens on uh, La Avenida Reforma. And I think that is a very powerful tool that people around the world have to con continue using. You know, it's not just about the Moros of Juarez, it's not just about Ayotzinapa, but it's about 150, 160,000 people who have been killed or disappeared. And, and it's about people in Mexico <clears throat> asking people in the United States Feel my loss, feel my pain, share my pain, uh, and pressure the U.S. government. If we, if, we're, if we become so integrated economically, politically, socially, I think there has to be a much bigger role on this side of the border. Uh, I know that history was a focus of this panel, but you asked the question. I mean, it's just quite interesting to compare Mexico over the time I've known it, which goes back to the 1970s. And although there are systemic and serious problems such as corruption, we do need to remember that many of those problems are evident in other parts of the world. We just had the, the, the so-called Panama Papers that shed light, a small bit of light on a chronic global problem, which you could call big, big corruption. And I would add also that in, in, on a more positive note, I mean, Mexico has changed substantially. There's a school of thought which sort of puts Mexico into some category and says, this is it, it's never going going to change. Some things are fairly stable and constant, but elections count for more. They may be a bit corrupt, but nevertheless they happen, and they happen regularly, and they can change governments. The media is much more investigative. We know much more about the corruption now than we would have done in the 1970s, when the media was much more controlled. Mexico has a larger middle class, higher literacy, and last of all, among many other things you could mention, the role of women has changed and continues to change. And, and one of the important reasons, one of the factors connected to that is the dramatic fall in the birth rate. In the 1970s, the Mexican population was growing at nearly 4% per annum, and that was unsustainable if you wanted proper economic growth, 
it's now dropped to about the same level as in the United States. So there are many changes in Mexico. It's not a static society. Some of them, the changes are perhaps for the better, others not necessarily. But I think you need to sort of matizar to see the, the good and the bad. Otherwise, there is a tendency, particularly abroad, to sort of put Mexico into a category in which the negatives are exaggerated, and particularly because violence is so eye-catching and so sensationalist, there's often a concentration on that at the expense of many other important structural changes that have happened in the country. Because of the rise of, uh, the, uh, saying, the, the rise of independent candidates in Mexico is a, is a big, big step, and we'll see some of that uh, this June with, uh, with uh, midterm elections. Well, well, thank you very much uh, to all of you, and uh, thank you for, for listening to so attentively. And uh, we'll have another panel. I don't know if, are we taking a pause, or are we going straight yeah, to the so next? I was going to say, I'm over here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Zeb, can you everybody uh, join me in thanking the panelists for the, the first panel? I appreciate it very much. Um, we're going to take uh, just a few minutes to switch out panels. The next one's on smuggling and drugs, and I imagine a lot of questions will follow up on a lot of things we talked about now. So about five, five minutes or so, we'll reconvene for the second panel. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like, follow, or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it even when you call.